There are I strain, but if futile ever, to flute my feelings through some naked shoot. Alas, how can I interpret my mood? They took away the language of my blood. If I could speak the language of my blood, my voice would whirl up through resistless space. Swiftly, sure, flight no one can retrace, and flung against the sky in breast of God, its scattered words. Charged with a passion where the treble blow would dim the stars now there. Shakespeare, Dante, Sappho, and the rest, they who are now as poets deify, never their lavish being them denied. Their moods could be felicitous express. Crimson of joy, purple of grief, gray of unrest, white of relief. Their dreams so colored, living forms they seem, the real lent enchantment like some fairy dream. If I could speak the language of my blood, my feet would trace the path their feet have trod, and take me a niche within their lot of fame, of chain and gold, and carve me their name. Ah, could I speak the language of my blood? I too would free the poetry in me. And this now apathetic world would be awakened, startled at the silver flood of song, my soul aptly expressing each flood note listeners impressing, more as the water drop into a pearl congealed than as a ripple on the ocean's breast revealed. These words I speak are out of pitch with me, that other voice sees longing to be free. How can thou speak who has affinity? Only with promise but unflowered days, only with ill-conceived eternity, being as they mere space lost into space, forever shalt thou cry, a mutant god, could I but speak the language of my blood. those questions constitute a veritable history, a genealogy of Filipino women writers using English as their medium, writers whose poems and short stories comprise the present anthology. In 1898, the United States, by a right called the Manifest Destiny, decided to assume control and disposition of the Philippine government. They immediately recognized the urgent need to facilitate its administrations of the islands by propagating and designating one official language, and that is English. 
the language was taught nationwide, and the propagation of English was to be an instrument of colonial policy. But the Filipinos were not aware of this at the time. They thought that they welcomed the propagating, propagation of English as a pure benevolence by the white Americans. And the investment of the U.S. paid off since the literacy rate of um, Philippines in 1903 was only 5%, rising up to today's literacy rate, which is 88%. One indication is the existence of a substantial body literature written by Filipinos in the English language, but it's merely a tributary in the mainstream of the Philippines literature, which is written usually in various vernacular languages. The more politically oriented of the present generation of Filipino writers now claim that their predecessor's view of English as an instrument of personal liberation was in fact just an illusory. Illusory because um, since it ult ultimately served as an instrument of their colonization, what their political nyapit prevented them from recognizing at that time was that while the use of English enabled them to appropriate Anglo-American literature as the site of their own poetry, it also alienated them from the centuries-old tradition of vernacular literature. So um, the English language had so constituted Filipino poets as subjects that they were unable to recognize themselves as subjects to cultural colonization. The irony, of course, is that the more completely they were colonized as subjects, the more blind they were to the facts of their subjection, and the less their anxiety over the alienation from their own national heritage. English is an equalizing factor. The prior Filipino writers, not excluding Trinidad Tarasa Subido herself, who wrote the poem, Muted Cry, um, had a special reason for viewing English as an instrument of personal liberation. And like the young Filipino women who had to assert their right to formal education during the Spanish colonial period, um, Filipino women of this time were welcoming to schools and even in the universities, sitting side by side with their male classmates. And they listened to American professors teach them the rudiments of an English language. And like their previous experience with the Spanish, they were there right there alongside the males, males learning the same language. Because um, Filipino women at the Spanish colonial period does not have equal rights to the Filipino males, especially in learning other foreign language. So even more significantly, they were learning a language totally foreign to both sexes. So this time around, um, the males did not enjoy a head start, of course, to play, this placed females and males at the same starting line, so to speak. In this way, English serves as an equalizing factor, allowing women equal starting line and equal opportunity to expression. So, of course, opportunity is not the same as actuality. The relative absence of women's writing in Philippine literature in English has not gone unnoticed nor unlamented, but it is important to point out that um, unlike women writers in the vernacular, women writers in English were present from the very beginning of Philippine literature in English. The first poems published in English in a maiden issue of the Filipino Students Magazine in 1905 one of which is a woman, and that is Maria G. Romero. And of course, the first short story in English published in 1927 is written by a woman also, and that, and that is Dead Stars by Paz Marquez Benitez. What circumstances have allowed women writers in English to write? Hmm. The answer lies in the fact that Filipino women writers in English belong, as they did to the elite, have been blessed with advantages of wealth, education, and employment not available to most other Filipino women. <laughs>